Today from the Global Lane, mail-in vote fraud? Why China may pose the biggest threat to the integrity of the November election. They are going to be in our election much more than Russia was in in 2016. Perpetual coup against President Trump? A guilty plea, but who may be next? James Comey, John Brennan, James Clapper, Andrew McCabe. These were all Obama's people. They dedicated America to God. But 400 years later, just 40 miles from where the pilgrims landed, you can fly a gay rainbow flag, but not a Christian one. And it's all right here on the Global Lane. Tick tock, tick tock. The clock is ticking against a popular Chinese social media platform. President Trump has given TikTok parent company ByteDance until November 12th to sell its U.S. assets if it's to continue operating in the United States. The Chinese government is expressing outrage, saying TikTok does not pose any national security threat to the United States and that Trump is, quote, plundering with force and using the logic of robbers and political interest. The TikTok ultimatum and other tensions have caused the cancellation of the resumption of trade talks between the two countries. Well, China analyst Gordon Chang joins us to weigh in with more. His latest book is The Great U.S.-China Tech War. Gordon, it's good to have you uh, here again. So it's understandable, isn't it, that it would be difficult to resume trade talks right now. I know a lot has transpired uh, between the two countries since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. TikTok, just the tip of the iceberg, correct? Oh, well, certainly. And, and TikTok, you know, people talk about it as surveilling U.S. users. And yes, it does. Uh, Apple caught it twice this year, in April and June, doing that. But also TikTok, um, many people believe, has been surreptitiously down downloading software on user devices. And the biggest sin of all is, going, is China's manipulation of American political opinion through TikTok. TikTok has very powerful artificial intelligence. They use it to influence Americans uh, by the videos that they see, because those are curated by algorithms that are actually developed in Beijing and then inserted into the TikTok software in the United States. And I know the Chinese government is also unhappy about actions taken against Huawei. Uh, President Trump convinced the U.K., to ban the Chinese company from its 5G uh, network. Also, Huawei is not allowed to operate here uh, as U.S. companies are all out 5G here. So how great is the Huawei security threat, in your opinion? Well, Huawei um, wants to dominate 5G, the fifth generation of wireless communications. That's the Internet of Things. And that means almost every device in the world is going to be connected to that 5G network. And if Huawei were to dominate it, two things that we've got to be concerned about. First of all, that China would surreptitiously download information and put it into China's AI systems in Beijing. Second thing is they might be able to manipulate all of these devices. So, for example, they could drive your self-driving car off the cliff. So, yes, we've got to be extremely concerned about 5G and Huawei. And recently I interviewed Robert Spaulding at Hudson Institute. He says... The greater threat from China in the future may not be a military one, but their moves to dominate global technology. Now, that's the subject of your book. How important is it uh, for the United States to challenge China in the high-tech area? Well, it's, it's absolutely critical because high technology is going to dominate the economy of the world, and we want Americans to have that technology. China's been stealing it by hundreds of billions of dollars a year of intellectual property. And so clearly Beijing feels this is important. Uh, Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, has his Made in China 2025 plan to dominate um, first 10 and now 11 critical tech sectors. So um, this is the space race of the 21st century. And how about Chinese efforts, Gordon, to change the outcome of the November election? You alluded to this about influence on uh, social media like TikTok. So how great is that effort in addition to just electronic hacking? I know the president says they could print mail-in ballots. So how likely is that? Well, you know, China um, could very well be trying to mess with the infrastructure of uh, the electoral process because much of it is done online these days. Um, but what I focus on is what China has been doing to manipulate opinion. So, for instance, there have been these malicious disinformation campaigns about the coronavirus and about the George Floyd protests. But also China has got its troll farms operating. So we've got all of these fake accounts. And Twitter, for instance, in June, 
um, took down 174,000 fake Chinese accounts. Other social media platforms have done the same thing. Just last week, they found another one, um, or they know about another one, and they actually started to move against it. That's the uh, Splamophage Dragon um, operation. So China has been working very, very intensely, and, and they are going to be in our election much more than Russia was in in 2016. And it, it's not just their efforts uh, to influence the election through public opinion, but I've got to ask you about the mistreatment of Christians in China, because that's getting worse and the independence of the Catholic Church is almost non-existent now. There's a crackdown against house churches. That's intensifying. Why now, Gordon? Well, Xi Jinping, I guess, feels that faith is the enemy of communism. And so we have seen moves across the board. It's not just Christianity, of course. It's also Islam. And even, you know, and this is, this is absolutely fascinating, Gary. Um, they're going after Buddhism, which is considered to be a Chinese religion, so really what it now is, is a full front campaign. And I think it's because Xi Jinping believes he's got the ability to do it with his total surveillance state. And uh, I think he feels insecure enough so that he believes that now's the time. And something Mao never had, right? So what should we do about these China challenges, Gordon? Uh, will it really make a difference no matter who wins the presidential election in November? Can China be stopped or is it too late? Oh, we can easily stop China. And the moves that President Trump has been taking recently have been extremely effective, especially the ones against Huawei and, of course, the trade issues with the Section 301 tariffs. We, we got to remember, Gary, that every American president tries in the first year in office to um, come to some sort of accommodation with Beijing. And President Trump did that in 2017. You know, if Biden were elected, and, and this is forgetting about how Biden feels about China, but if Biden were elected, he would be wasting months and maybe years trying to do the same thing. And right now, we don't have any moments to lose because China is relentlessly attacking us across the board. So that's the reason why this is a concern about the continuity of China policy, which, by the way, for the first time in three decades, is actually working to the advantage of the United States. And a real sense of urgency now. Gordon Chang, China analyst, author of The Great U.S.-China Tech War. Thank you, Gordon. We appreciate you. Thank you for being here, sharing your insights. Well, thank you, Gary. Life is better with a good night's sleep. Get your free DVD or booklet of Protect Your Sleep as the world watches from the outside. It's a big diplomatic tug of war here in the Middle East. Go inside the story with Jerusalem Dateline. Israeli archaeologists are talking about a discovery that could change the thinking about the Temple Mount. Join CBN Jerusalem Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell and get the biblical perspective on the event shaping the world. It's what starts in Israel then ends up going to other places. Watch Jerusalem Dateline Friday night at 9.30 on the CBN News Channel. Life, it's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it, I came to give you life, life to the fullest, life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your every day. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life. Live it fully. CBN.com. As Democrats hit the airwaves for the virtual 2020 convention, the Senate Intelligence Committee released its report on Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. The report concludes the Trump campaign had extensive contacts with Russians, but the committee found no evidence of collusion. 
Release of the Senate report comes as former CIA Director John Brennan meets with Department of Justice investigators. Brennan's testimony is considered crucial in John Durham's efforts to get to the bottom of the Crossfire Hurricane domestic spying operation. Well, joining us with more is veteran journalist Lee Smith. He is uh, an author of a new book just out this week, The Permanent Coup, How Enemies Foreign and Domestic Targeted the American President. So, Lee, we've seen some initial action taken in the John Durham investigation of Crossfire Hurricane, a guilty plea from former FBI attorney Kevin Kleinsmith. Now, the John Brennan interview, the former CIA director, uh, shared information about Russians and the Trump campaign with senior officials in the Obama administration. So how legitimate was his information? Did he share it with President Barack Obama? And was Obama or Brennan the Crossfire Hurricane mastermind? Well, those are all excellent questions, and uh, I get to many of them in my book. I mean, John Brennan was, in fact, an Oval Office insider. So he was the director of the CIA while he was also very close uh, to Barack Obama. And he was a political figure, not just an intelligence figure. Um, so, yes, he's heavily involved. And when he was bragging about how he started to, he was responsible for initiating the FBI's investigation, which, as we know, is the Crossfire Hurricane investigation, I decided to take Mr. Brennan at his word and look into it and see what actual role he had in starting that investigation. And it looks like Mr. Brennan has a, uh, a rather central role in initiating this, as you say, a domestic spying operation against the Trump campaign, then the uh, transition team, and then the presidency itself. So I certainly think that whatever Mr. Durham and his investigators will be uh, asking Mr. Brennan or whatever they found in documentary evidence will go right to the heart of the matter. Well, was he the mastermind or Barack Obama? Well, there's certainly we've we've seen documents over the last several months now declassified that show that Barack Obama was certainly involved in the investigation of General Flynn. There was a, a document declassified at the end of June showing that Barack Obama told James Comey to investigate Flynn, to continue to investigate Flynn, and get the so right people get the right people on it, right? The right people. So I, make sure you look at everything and get the right people on it. Exactly, which is telling him to investigate General Flynn. Uh, earlier on, yes, certainly, if, if John Brennan is showing or telling Barack Obama or putting information on his desk, as, uh, as we know from reports, putting investigations, uh, putting information on his desk in August of 2016, 100 percent Barack Obama was read into this investigation. Was he the mastermind? That's not, uh, that's not clear yet. But certainly, we have to remember, we've been talking about Hillary Clinton's role for the last three years since the Clinton campaign paid for the Steele dossier. However, it's important to remember all of these people, all of these intelligence chiefs worked for Barack Obama at the time. James Comey, John Brennan, James Clapper, Andrew McCabe. These were all Obama's people. That's central to understanding what's been going on here in the last four years. Yes, and I, uh, I remember from my history that Harry Truman said the buck stops here. On July yeah. 24, 2016, the narrative began when Hillary Clinton's campaign manager claimed that Russia had hacked into the DNC computers and stole emails, gave them to WikiLeaks. Why was that central to the narrative? And what about Julian Assange? He refuted that, saying that Russia was not the source of the emails that he published, but now he's in prison. Many Americans right. still believe that narrative. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, w among the documents that we saw declassified over the uh, over the spring by acting uh, DNI director Richard Grinnell and uh, his deputy, Cash Patel, who plays a large part in this book and played a large part in my, uh, in my previous book as well, w one of the things that we know was the people who claimed the private organization, private uh, company, CrowdStrike, which had been hired by the Clinton campaign to investigate that uh, that hack, said the owner, one of the owners testified, there was actually no evidence that the Russians were behind it. And finally, you say this coup will not end if Donald Trump is reelected in November. Why is that? If people actually go to jail, won't the effort to end? Because there would be a price to pay. Yes. If we look at one of the things that's happened now, we see how uh, what started with 
a massive conspiracy theory known as Russia Gate or Russia, Russia collusion, has now turned into this nonsensical story, this mailbox conspiracy. Um, but what they're doing is they're laying the groundwork before the election to, in the event that Donald Trump is reelected, his uh, his victory will be delegitimized. They're laying the groundwork for for conflict. That's what happens when you tell half of the people in the country that their choice is illegitimate and he has to be moved out of office through extra constitutional means. That's what I mean when I say the coup will continue. There will be further operations targeting not just the president, but the way that we live as Americans, our political process, uh, our political processes, our mores. If you look at what's happened over the last several months during the spring and summer, the way that American cities have been targeted by Antifa and BLM, both of which have support from the from the Democratic Party. So yes, unfortunately, uh, and certainly worryingly, the the coup will continue. Okay, rough seas ahead. We'll see how all of this flushes out. Lee Smith, you're the author of the just released book, The Permanent Coup: How Enemies, Foreign and Domestic, Targeted the American President. Thank you for sharing those insights today, Lee. Appreciate it. So much for inviting me. Daddy? Yeah, buddy? How many nickels are in a dollar? There are 20 nickels Look, in a dollar. How do birds fly? Does milk really make my bones stronger? Yeah, yeah. Daddy, when we die, will we go to heaven? Do you have the answer to life's biggest question? Call the 700 Club. We'll help you find answers to the important questions life brings your way. Watch breaking news, in-depth exclusive stories and programs from health to entertainment. You won't find anywhere else the CBN News Channel, a perspective you can trust. Enjoy credible news reporting from around the world. Discover inspiring programs and stories of hope, all in one place from a Christian perspective. The CBN News Channel, a perspective you can trust. To watch the CBN News Channel, download the app or visit CBNNewsChannel.com. Hello, I'm Dr. David Perlmutter, board certified neurologist and number one New York Times bestselling author. Wouldn't it be great to boost your energy, eliminate brain fog, and even reverse brain disease? Well, you can, and I'm going to show you how along with some of the world's most well-respected brain experts in this DVD, Protect Your Brain. Get Protect Your Brain, a free DVD, only from the Christian Broadcasting Network, featuring experts on the cutting edge of neuroscience and brain health. No matter how many times you've failed in the past, you really can do this. In Protect Your Brain, you'll discover simple strategies to keep your brain young and healthy. Improve your memory. Discover the gut-brain connection. In Protect Your Brain, get your free copy at CBN.com or call 1-800-700-7000. If you want to improve the quality of your life, get the DVD, Protect Your Brain, and get it today. The Trump campaign and the Republican Party are taking legal action to stop the state of New Jersey from moving forward with its November election plans. Their lawsuit claims Governor Phil Murphy's executive order to send out mail-in ballots to all Garden State voters will create a recipe for disaster, leading to vote fraud. Well, here to set us straight on mail-in balloting is research director at the Government Accountability Institute, Eric Eggers. Mr. Eggers is author of the book, Fraud, How the Left Plans to Steal the Next Election. Eric, it's always good to see you. So, New Jersey... Eight other states, the District of Columbia, are going to uh, mail-in balloting. Others may do the same. Is this a recipe for disaster, as the president says, or just giving more people an opportunity to participate in the election? Uh, it's giving lots of opportunities for lots of things, uh, including, I think, sadly, an increase in the possibility of voter fraud. I mean, look what happened just in June, one month after New Jersey conducted its first ever mail-in election statewide during a primary. You had in one of the largest cities in the state, Patterson, New Jersey, an elected official and multiple other people indicted and arrested on allegations of voter fraud. They found hundreds of ballots suspiciously bound together in just a few mailboxes. You had other political operatives admitting to investigators that they would go around and take ballots from certain mailboxes. There were allegations that they were also taking signatures from ballots and compiling their own database of signatures 
to be able to possibly force signatures on additional ballots. So I would say, based on the limited evidence we have of what does a mail-in ballot election in, Jer in New Jersey look like, it isn't good. Well, we often hear there's no evidence of mail-in balloting fraud. You just mentioned one, New Jersey, but there is. Uh, how about some others that you found? Yeah, unfortunately, in my research, I found that, and it's not just me, uh, bipartisan experts agree that anytime you have ballots that are cast via mail, whether it's absentee ballots or the mass mailing of ballots to people, whether they request them or not, it's going to be an increase for recipes for fraud. Um, unfortunately, senior citizens often fall prey and become victims in this practice. There's an entire uh, sort of industry known as granny farming, and that is when senior citizens are targeted by political operatives. They know that the absentee ballots or mail-in ballots will arrive. They're there to ostensibly help senior citizens. And unfortunately, oftentimes you see outcomes that are less than ideal for not only democracy, but our elderly. Others uh, committing fraud against our senior citizens. So I know Democrats and never Trumpers are saying the president's just trying to steal the election by suppressing the vote. And even uh, Republican Senator Mitt Romney, he claims that mail-in ballots would be easier to track for fraud than fraudulent electronic voting. What do you think of that? Well, I would just say that's inconsistent with the evidence we've seen so far when we've seen increases in mail-in balloting or absentee balloting through the primaries in this COVID era. Uh, states like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and California have seen problems in terms of ballots not being delivered, ballots not being counted by Election Day. They've had to stop and go back and double-check to see if double voting was occurring. Um, you know, we've had you know massive increases in terms of the delays, and uh, it is actually harder because the reality is our system is just not ready for the predicted doubling of increase of mail-in balloting coming this fall. And I would say if you look at some of the reports coming out of Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and California, I think it's right to be concerned that these states are just unprepared for the volume that is pending. And Eric, what about the argument that the country needs to go to mail-in balloting? because it's unsafe for people to actually go out to the polls in the midst of a pandemic. Well, uh, I will say I actually voted in person yesterday in Tallahassee, Florida, had their primary elections uh, on August 18th, and, you know, I'm still here. But obviously, I respect anybody that wants to protect their own health when participating in the electoral process. I just don't think it should happen at the expense of American democracy. And I think that the evidence, unfortunately, suggests that when we have increases in mail-in balloting and increases in absentee balloting, I think it only increases the likelihood uh, of bad actors committing fraud. Okay, Eric Eggers from the Government Accountability Institute and author of the book, Fraud, How the Left Plans to Steal the Next Election. Always good to talk to you, Eric. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Gary. If you want to be an attorney with a passion for serving people and for excellence, Regent University needs to be high on your list. Regent's award-winning law school doesn't just create lawyers. We create leaders, judges, prosecutors and defense lawyers, civil litigators, and leaders in government. Ready to become a purpose-driven, practice-ready lawyer? To start your rewarding career, complete the online application, submit your transcripts, and take the law school admissions test by July. Nutrition, exercise, essential oils, weight loss, and more. It's Healthy Living with Lori Johnson. Talk about what's in this. Join CBN Health reporter Lori Johnson to get the latest information from today's top health experts. This is fantastic. Find out what you need to know to live a healthier life. Watch Healthy Living, Tuesday night at 9.30. Superbook fans, here's something else you'll love. <laughs> it's the new Superbook Bible app. <laughs> it's packed with games, activities, and Superbook episodes that you can watch for free. Oh, no! There's trivia, a fun daily devotional, and answers to your Bible questions. Plus, an easy-to-understand Bible the whole family will enjoy. You can even create your own Superbook character. Ta-da! Come and... Sorry, pardon me. Sorry, excuse me. Ouch! Are you getting this? Earn super points to win daily prizes, too. And so much more! <sighs> Time to get back to my adventures. See you soon. It's the new Superbook Bible app.
free downloads on iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon. More anti-Christian bias is raising its ugly head in America, this time in Boston, Mass. Hal Shirtliff leads a Christian civic organization called Camp Constitution. Apparently, private groups are allowed to raise flags on a city flagpole each September 17th. That's Constitution Day. Let's see, there's the Turkish flag, which depicts an Islamic star and a crescent moon. Also allowed, a gay pride rainbow flag and a pink and blue transgender flag. And flags are raised by others honoring Mexico, Brazil, Ethiopia, Puerto Rico, etc., etc. You get the idea. The city has allowed a total of 248 private groups to raise flags. But Shirtlift's group, Camp Constitution, nope. They applied to raise their flag, a Christian flag like this one. A white field, red cross with a blue square in the upper corner. No dice. Rejected by the city of Austin. Why? The city says because their application stated the group wanted to fly a Christian flag on the city flagpole for an hour, just like the other groups. But apparently the city of Boston mistakenly thinks if a private group flies a Christian flag on a city flagpole, it will be an endorsement of religion. Based on that reasoning, flying a gay rainbow flag then would be an endorsement of the gay rights agenda. Or a Turkish flag would be an endorsement of an Islamic nation that actually committed genocide against Armenians in 1915. That Turkey? Oh yeah, that one. Hogwash. Flying the Christian flag just like allowing others to fly theirs is not the city's endorsement of anything. It's simply recognizing the free speech rights of private citizens. Their right to participate in a day honoring the greatness of a document committed to individual liberty and collective freedom for all American citizens. Those actions must include, not exclude, Boston's Christian citizenry. Denying the Camp Constitution Group's First Amendment right, while at the same time allowing other groups to fly their flags, is discriminatory. It shows partiality, and that is unconstitutional. Liberty Council has filed a brief in the First Circuit Court of Appeals on behalf of Shirtliff and Camp Constitution. Not far from Boston, where this is happening, is Plymouth, Massachusetts. Now, that's where one of my ancestors first arrived in North America on the Mayflower. Thomas Rogers was among the Puritan settlers who signed the Mayflower Compact, a document committing the new colony to democracy and the glory of God and the furtherance of the Christian faith. That's why my ninth great-grandfather came to New England for religious freedom. He and half of the pilgrims died during that harsh first winter in America. I'm sure Rogers and the other Plymouth Colony settlers would be grieved to know that 400 years later, Christians are being denied the right to simply fly a Christian flag on a flagpole. Yes, it's happening just 40 miles from where the pilgrims landed to help found the greatest Judeo-Christian country on earth. Isn't it sad it's come to this? May God help us and the city where the first shot of the American Revolution was heard around the world. Well, that's it today from the Global Lane. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, Parlor, and Twitter. And until next time, be blessed.